Good day and welcome to Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. I'm John Marino. We are produced by Shark Creative, made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built. By Lipolis Electric, don't be left in the dark, get Lipolis. And by Hightower, Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard. Here on The Beat in Westchester is our program, and we are joined by Scott Richmond. Scott Richmond is the New York, New Jersey Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League. We've had Scott on a couple of times before in the past few months discussing anti-Semitic hatred and more. And Scott Richmond, I just want to open up by saying with this latest wave of anti-Semitic and anti-Asian hatred that we've seen around the metropolitan area and around the country, it seems like this is a revolving door that keeps happening over and over and over again. And in light of everything we've done since the pandemic began to focus on eliminating hatred of all sorts, we don't seem to be heading in the right direction. So uh, first of all, John, thank you so much for having me on. Really always uh, a pleasure. Um, and I really, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak with you and your listeners. Always and, good to have you, Scott. Thank you. And yes, you're, you're correct. It is uh, it is a bit disheartening, I would say. Uh, I, you know, I would, I would take us back to April, to uh, ADL's audit. So ADL does an audit of anti-Semitic incidents every year. We release it in the spring, and it shows uh, where we are the year before. So we released our 2020 audit in April. Now, uh, that is an, uh, an audit we've been doing since 1979. So we have 41 years of data to, to look at. Uh, and, you know, we know there's underreporting. We know we don't capture every single anti-Semitic incident. And of course, these are only anti-Semitic incidents that are targeted at individuals or groups, but not sort of a, a broad statement. Um, but, you know, in terms of identifying trends, in terms of identifying where we're going, uh, new types of anti-Semitism, it's very important. And I will also stress that this is not a survey. It's not us going out and saying, are you encountering anti-Semitism? This is ADL's work in the trenches. We are responding to anti-Semitic incidents literally every day. My office is responding to anti-Semitic incidents every day. So this is a compilation of the work we did throughout 2020 across the country in 25 different regional offices, responding to incidents, working with victims, working with law enforcement, working with community officials, working with the media, et cetera. So that's where this comes from. Now, to answer your question, uh, what I would say is that that survey uh, or audit rather, it showed us that uh, anti-Semitic incidents were at historic highs in 2020. Historic and, highs. Historic highs. So for us, that was fairly surprising because you would think that with physical distancing, with lockdowns, uh, that we would uh, go down considerably. And, you know, maybe it's just a low, but we would go down considerably. But that was not the case. 2019, the year before, was the highest year on record of the 40 years. 2020 is only 4% below it, and it's higher than 2018, higher than 2017, higher than 2016, 15, 14, et cetera. So that's a big problem. What happened was we did go down in some areas. ADL looks at this, uh, at anti-Semitic incidents in three areas, harassment, assault, and vandalism. In assault and vandalism, we went down. Those often require uh, being physical in, in, in a place, but harassment can take place online. And that's really the big difference that we saw uh, anti-Semitism online, on social media, increase tremendously. And we saw it uh, with Zoom bombing, for example, where uh, people would come into to Zoom forums, Zoom rooms, and disrupt them, maybe with anti-Semitic statements, uh, kill the Jews, gas the Jews were statements that, that you would hear. Nazi symbolism, uh, really, really heinous stuff. So that type of attack went up. Attacks on Jewish institutions went up. Uh, so that, that sort of accounted for the idea that this was still at historic highs. And that's where we were, uh, in terms of our understanding of this at the end of April. 
Then we have the conflict in the Middle East, the conflict between Israel and Hamas, and we see an incredible wave of anti-Semitism hit this country, really the world, because we saw it all over Europe, many, many places. Right. And certainly here in the New York area, uh, really a torrent of, uh, of anti-Semitic incidents, people being assaulted in broad daylight um, because they were visibly Jewish or entering a Jewish institution, uh, really, really horrific and something that we should all be upset about. And now one can have whatever opinion they want of the government of Israel, the actions of the state of Israel, the actions of the Israel Defense Forces, the actions of Hamas, the actions of the Palestinian Authority. You can have all of those. You're entitled to all of those and you're entitled to express them in this country. But what you are not entitled to do is to blame a person simply because they're Jewish and, uh, and attack them violently simply because they're Jewish. That is not activism. That is anti-Semitism. And that's what's been going on. And that, uh, that came after we saw the results of this audit. So we have seen an uptick in anti-Semitism of at least 75%. Uh, from just before the, the conflict to during and, and just after. That's a huge jump. And that's, that's sort of preliminary data. We're still sifting through it all. It's a huge amount, uh, that our staff is, is going through and trying to verify what these incidents were. Were they actually anti-Semitic? We're very careful to verify that these were, in fact, anti-Semitic incidents. What category do they fall into? So that's where we are today. And, uh, uh, it's it, it's really been a, a very difficult time, and it's, in my opinion, uh, simply unacceptable and needs to end soon. These are incredible numbers you talk about, the increases in anti-Semitic incidents, and you talk about Zoom bombing and how much people get away with online on the Internet. With all the talk about reforming policing the past year and a half or so, and even more, do we need to reform how we go after people who commit these kinds of crimes like this online? So, uh, first of all, I will say that these are not all crimes. Uh, these are uh, anti-Semitic incidents. Some of them may be crimes. Some of them may not be. If somebody walks up to you on the street and says to you, um, all Jews should die uh, or uh, gas the Jews or something like that uh, or threatens you, uh, that's speech. That's speech, and it's it's protected speech. If it if it, actually if it's if it's a threat and it's it's a speech that could lead to violence, that's different. But but uh, if it's protected speech, that is clearly an anti-Semitic incident, but it may not rise to the level of a crime. Uh, second thing, I, and and we we take into account all of those, and and certainly if your listeners encounter anything, they should be reporting these things to us. It's so important that they report incidents to us. We may bring in law enforcement, we may not, but we'll deal with it no matter what it is, whether it's a crime or just an incident. They can go to adl.org forward slash report incident. It's a very simple form and everybody should re be reporting. If it's online, wherever, we can help you through how to report that on social media. Second thing I would say, though, is that law enforcement, uh, we've been working closely with them over the past few weeks on these, uh, on these uh, matters. And when it does rise to the level of a crime, um, we, we've been very pleased with law enforcement. They have devoted incredible resources, especially the NYPD Hate Crimes Task Force. They've been devoted incredible resources to dealing with these matters, to putting out uh, or, or to getting footage, video footage, uh, still footage that they can then put out and it can lead to an arrest. They've been posting rewards for tips that can lead to an arrest, and they've made quite a number of arrests. And by the way, this is not just in relation to anti-Semitism. We've seen it with all kinds of hate crimes, uh, and certainly with uh, the anti-Asian hate crimes that uh, we've uh, we've seen the wave of over the, the past few months, really the past year since the start of COVID. Uh, and there have been quite a number of arrests, and uh, we're really very pleased with uh, how much uh, or how seriously law enforcement is taking this. You talk about how the numbers are not really what they are, too, that the numbers are probably really worse, and a lot of things that happen go unreported. Are people who are the victims of 
these kinds of incidents sometimes afraid or fearful to come forward when they should not be? Absolutely. Uh, they're afraid to come forward. They don't know uh, with whom they should speak. They don't know if it rises to the level of a crime. Uh, they may be in some sort of compromised position, um, you know, and, and don't necessarily want to, to speak to the police. Uh, they, they don't want to bring visibility to themselves. Uh, I mean, there could be many, many reasons why. And that's why an, a, an organization like ADL becomes a sort of a, a safe harbor for them to come to. We could talk it through. You're not going to the police and uh, we can figure out the best course of action. At the end, and we, and we, would, end of we would never take a step without the permission of the victim. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like a clearinghouse in a way for people to come to you and say, here's what happened. What should we do? Absolutely. You know, ADL is, a, is an entity that has these relationships with law enforcement, whether it's local law enforcement, NYPD, a hate crimes task force, or more national, the FBI. We work closely with them with the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, uh, really at all different levels. We also bring a lot of resources to bear. So our Center on Extremism, which has existed for many, many years, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a place that, that has an incredible amount of data. Uh, if we see uh, issues and maybe there's patterns across the country, maybe there's photos, especially with Zoom bombing, you know, you'll see screenshots. Uh, we can compare those photos and see if in our database we have evidence that these people have acted in other ways. We have a hate symbols database. So hate symbols you see tattooed on people uh, or, or uh, the symbols are, are put on buildings, you know, in terms of vandalism, we could identify those. Also, our Center for Technology and Society is looking at hate online and trying to manage that. So, uh, you know, that, that's also a very important resource, especially when people are, uh, are reporting to us issues of hate on social media. We have contacts with... Um, top uh, social media companies and other technology companies and our Center for Technology and Society staff are software engineers themselves. So they understand this from a technological perspective. They know all the, the content moderation policies, all the policies that, that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram have, what they'll tolerate and how to report this and how to appeal it if you're not getting satisfaction and we'll help all of these people work through that. Uh, so we, we really bring a lot of resources to bear, uh, not to mention uh, a sympathetic shoulder to, uh, uh, to cry on. Mm -hmm. I know the ADL works and has worked through the years so closely with other groups that have been the victims of hatred and attacks. How much more closely do you work now with groups from the Asian community, groups from the African American community and more? I'm sure that is increasing because of the situation we're going through now. Sure. Our, our partner organizations uh, are critical. It's, it's critical to this agency that we be allies uh, when, when other um, faith and ethnic groups are attacked. Uh, and we look for them to be allies when, when we're attacked. Uh, in particular, I would say with the Asian uh, American community and Pacific Islander community, uh, it's, been a, it's been a very difficult time. But uh, that is an issue that we identified very early on and have been working very closely with our partners. Uh, I will talk about uh, more locally the Chinese American Planning Council. Uh, we've been working very closely with them and their staff. Uh, this is this is a social ser a large social service agency, but a social service agency that's not necessarily equipped to deal with hate. How do you deal with incidents? How do you deal with reporting things? How do you deal with media? How do you deal with uh, uh, legislatively, uh, do you have the contacts for all of this? So that's, that's become important. Uh, at the national level, uh, we've certainly been working with uh, the Committee of 100. Um, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, our national CEO, is a founding board member of the Asian American Foundation, which is now giving out grants to help with fighting hate. Uh, and he's a founding member, the only non-Asian founding member, because of all the work we've been doing with the Asian American community. I can say uh, with the African American community, we have uh, in New Jersey, uh, which is also part of my, my territory, we, um, uh, we have a, a memorandum of understanding signed with the NAACP. And on many of these big issues, we, we speak out with one voice. Uh, there was a school a few weeks ago 
uh, where a teacher had said some particularly heinous racist things to the students uh, and uh, NAACP and ADL spoke out together against that. Uh, and that, of course, was uh, very important to us. We've also been doing programming together. Um, if, th if there's hate against one, uh, there can be hate against all in our society. Uh, and we all need to speak out. Scott Richmond is the regional director in New York, New Jersey, regional director of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League here on Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. On the beat in Westchester, I'm John Marino. Scott, you talk about the rise and a really significant rise in incidents, anti-Semitic incidents, anti-Asian incidents, et cetera, around our area, the tri-state area, which you handle I always look at this area, and we know this area is a real melting pot, one of the biggest melting pots in the world. It's not the South. It's not the Midwest. It's not Arizona, New Mexico. People, cultures from all races, religions, ethnicities, and backgrounds meld together here, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, the Northeast. Why are so many incidents happening in a region where we seem to be what a melting pot is supposed to be, but maybe we really are not? Well, I mean, I think just in terms of the Jewish community, uh, and I, I should say very specifically in terms of the audit, uh, you are correct. Uh, we tracked anti-Semitic incidents in 47 of the 50 states. And uh, of those 47 states in, in our audit for 2020, New York was number one. It had the most incidents across the country, and New, new Jersey was number two. Uh, and I happen to be the director of ADL for New York and New Jersey. So uh, quite a number together, it's, it's well over 600 incidents. Um, so, uh, you know, in our case, in terms of the Jewish community, you're talking most likely about the number of Jews. Uh, uh, with a larger Jewish population, uh, that, that sort of stands to reason in terms of logic that, that there's going to be more incidents. You don't necessarily need Jews to have anti-Semitic incidents, uh, but, but sometimes you do. Vandalism of Jewish institutions, requires the presence of Jews, uh, harassment of Jews in, in public, um, assault of Jews, of course, uh, requires that presence. So that, I think, is, is a piece of it. Um, and, uh, you know, just in general, when, when you are such a melting pot, you have this, this sort of interaction. The vast majority of people are not anti-Semitic or anti-Asian or racist, uh, but there are some people uh, at the margins, at the extremes. And I think part of our challenge as a civil society is to push them to the extremes, to say this is unacceptable, to say that we, 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 don't, we won't tolerate this in our society. And the more we push them to the extremes, the more it becomes unacceptable, uh, the less it's going to happen. Uh, and I will add that in a time of increasing polarization, which is really the, the time we've been living through, uh, that becomes harder. It becomes harder to push because people take sides. And it's not a matter of the extremes, it's a matter of on my side, I'm right, and on your side, you're wrong, and I will forgive what happens on my side, even if it's at the extremes, but I will condemn anything that's done by the other side, whether or not it's at the extremes. So the idea of pushing people to the extremes is out of whack when you're in a polarized time. We hear President Biden talk a lot about unity and bringing people together, and I, I think uh, very, very important uh, for controlling this sort of hate and anti-Semitism. Let's take this a step further. And you mentioned the recent incidents in the Middle East. We just had another serious conflict in the Middle East that lasted for a couple of weeks, basically. Why do events in the Middle East translate into many more incidents of hatred over here on the other side of the world and around the world? So, uh, you know, Jews become an easy target, uh, an easy way for people to act out against whatever uh, concern they have uh, about the Middle East. It's obviously wrong. Uh, and as I said earlier in the show, it's not, it's not activism, it's, it's anti-Semitism uh, and it's hate uh, and it, it needs to be roundly condemned. Um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, of what happened uh, in the Middle East, uh, you know, we are, we're of course, grateful for the ceasefire, and, uh, and we hope that 
that things move along a, a more peaceful path. You were recently part of a forum, an anti-hatred forum, sponsored by State Senator Peter Harkin from the 37th State Senatorial District covering Northern Westchester, Putnam, and part of Dutchess County, too. Talk about what was discussed at that forum. So uh, Senator Harkin pulled together people from different faith and ethnic backgrounds uh, in order to, uh, to sort of present the, the, an understanding of what's happening in different communities. So I, have car- of course, spoke about the perspective of hate against the Jewish community, anti-Semitism. There was a representative of the Latino community, a representative of the African-American community, of the Muslim community, et cetera. And you know, I would say it's, it's a very important point. Hate manifests itself similarly in you know, across the broad spectrum of communities, but also in a different way. And these are all forms of bias and bigotry, but if we take, for example, systemic racism. So systemic racism against African-Americans is really, it manifests itself in a system that keeps people from achieving their full potential, from uh, achieving their full potential in terms of education, in terms of professions, in terms of wealth accumulation, uh, pe- keeping, keeping a certain group of people down, let's say. Um, I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to speak for the African American community, but that, that's sort of my understanding of systemic racism. Anti-Semitism manifests itself in a very different way, and there may be overlap, but by and large, it represents itself in terms of tropes. We call it tropes. So, um, anti-Semitism manifests itself in terms of Jews being accused of having too much power. They control government. They control media. They they control the weather. Um, it manifests itself in terms of money. Jews have too much money or they're, they're, they're too greedy or, or however you want to uh, express it. Or people talk about dual loyalty. So here you have the issue of, uh, of Israel. Or it manifests itself in terms of a blood libel, Jews treating non-Jews in some sort of wrong way. Uh, or the deicide charge, the idea that Jews have killed uh, Jesus. Now that, that of course, changed uh, in a formal way with Nostra Aetate in the late 1960s, declaration by, by the Catholic leadership that that was not the case, but there are still people who believe it and you still hear it from time to time via a charge. So anti-Semitism has very particular manifestation and each one of us on this panel kind of talked about how hatred towards that group manifests itself and uh, how we can work together to support one another. How do we bring people together? After all this, after everything we've gone through, after everything that's gone on, how do we bring people together? Because I find it nonsensical that we can't bring people together of all stripes now after all of this. And I think we're at, after the recent events in the Middle East, I think we're at a critical time right now, a critical juncture. We have an opportunity now after that to really make some inroads in getting people together once and for all. Say, stop this nonsense. Yeah. Let's hope that uh, um, the the new government in Israel, which is actually a coming together of, uh, of many different perspectives, uh, people who don't necessarily share one another's point of view, uh, let's hope that 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 government can can hold uh, and perhaps be an example for the way that that people can come together and with common cause uh, and and work through those issues. Uh, and certainly in our in our own country with our own Congress, um, and, you know. Uh, working through differences of opinion is, uh, is very important. Um, what I would say in terms of, of ways that we can move forward, uh, you know, first of all, speaking out. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important that, we, that our leaders speak out, that they use their bully pulpit uh, and say that, that the sort form of hate is unacceptable. Uh, we've seen from President Biden on down, uh, a lot of people making statements against anti-Semitism, against anti-Asian hate. And that is uh, very much what needs to be done. Our coalition partners need to do this as well. We need to hear from, from our friends, from our allies, uh, that they as a community uh, abhor this type of hate um, and also very important. We as individuals n- uh, have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to, to call out those who are engaging in hate, who are spreading misinformation and certainly online there are a lot of ways that we can play that role. Uh, we there's a there's a huge bully pulpit that we each have on social media 
to get our points across and to be able to report hate and misinformation, which we need to do. We need to let Facebook know or Twitter know. Don't just look at what's on your feed and say, that's ridiculous, that's completely untrue, or that's an awful thing to say. Report it. We each have that role to play. Uh, I would also say that, um, you know, these, these are sort of more short term ways of approaching this, and there are more long term ways. Uh, so, a lot of pieces of legislation, important pieces of legislation that need to move forward. Uh, so, for example, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act uh, or a reform of Section 230. Section 230, uh, it, it removes liability from social media companies for what is on their site. That needs to change. Um, also, even more long term, education initiatives. So, you know, we need to change the hearts and minds. People need to be sensitive uh, to bias and bigotry and the words that they're using and, and the statements that, that, that are coming out of their mouths and the, the actions. Um, so ADL does a huge amount of work in the schools uh, with anti-bias and anti-bullying uh, work in New York and New Jersey. We're in hundreds of schools impacting hundreds of thousands of students every year with anti-bias and anti-bullying work. Very important for our future that we find a way to, uh, uh, to, to help people to understand what this situation is and how they need to act towards, uh, uh, towards, uh, towards others. Are too many people afraid to speak up when they come across an incident of anti-Semitism or a hatred of any kind? That's the impression I get. Um, I, you know, I, I think either people say uh, it won't make a difference or they say, uh, I don't know, you know, who am I going to tell this to? Uh, you know, there are lots of excuses people come up with, but uh, or, or they don't want to rock the boat uh, or they have uh, they don't want to say something to their friend that somehow may uh, tick their friend off and then the, the friend won't, won't want to interact with them. Even uh, fear of retaliation, too? Yeah, who knows? So, you know, all of these things matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, I sympathize with that. Uh, but people need to try as hard as they can. Uh, and people need to kind of rise above it and say that this is more important. And if we collectively, as, uh, as a society, take these steps, uh, it's going to go a long, long way towards pushing hate to the margins. I like what you said about rising above. The ADL right now, what kind of programs does the ADL offer for those who might want to get involved with learning more about hatred, learning more about what we can do to stop hatred? Not only stem the tide, but stop this. I don't know. I wonder if it's ever really stoppable. We might always have those out there who, for whatever their reasons, want to hate. They're just haters for whatever their reasons might be. But to Bring this to a point in society where we don't even have to talk much about this anymore because it's a problem that becomes basically, hopefully, solved. So, first of all, I would direct your listeners to our website. Uh, our website, ADL.org, has an incredible amount of information, an incredible number of resources, uh, especially the education page. So, if you go to ADL.org forward slash education, you're going to see a lot of information there. Um, uh, a lot of it is, is, uh, divided into, you know, elementary school, middle school, and high school. How to have a conversation about what just happened in the Middle East. How to have a conversation about the election. Books to read about anti, uh, 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 about Asian Americans, about racism. All kinds of resources there that, uh, that we should be employing or we should be sharing with our schools. Um, uh, very, very important. Um, hopefully, uh, people will be, continue to connect schools with ADL so that the kinds of programs that we have uh, will we'll get into the schools. Our No Place for Hate program, very important program for bringing together teachers and administrators and parents and students to work together to engage in activities in schools. And, it, and they do this over the course of a, of a school year. And at the end of the year, they are designated a No Place for Hate school. Uh, we have thousands of those across the country now, a very important movement. Our World of Difference program, we go in and we engage in facilitated conversations with students, with teachers. We train people how to do that. Um, we work uh, closely 
with, um, uh, with, with all different segments of society and to the extent that your listeners can be ambassadors for this work and reach out and say, you know, you need to become connected to ADL. Uh, you need to be attuned to, uh, to what the ADL is saying. That's very important. And the best way to do that at this point, the easiest way is social media. So I am tweeting many times a day. ADL is tweeting many times a day. My handle is at Scott A. Richmond with a middle initial A, S-C-O-T-T-A, Richmond, R-I-C-H-M-A-N. You know, your, your listeners should follow me and they should, they should share the content that I'm putting out there or ADL is putting out there. ADL New York, New Jersey. ADL uh, nationwide is putting out there. It's very easy and very important. We need everybody to be ambassadors and amplify this uh, this content. Scott, I see the work that you do, you and the ADL, what you put out online across social media. And I want to thank you for all you've done through the years. I know you, we know each other for a long time now. And Previous iterations of your life professionally, what you've done, I've seen that. I've watched you work with that and at that. And just want to say thank you for all you've done and all I know you will continue to do. And I hate to be trite. I hate to use cliches, but together we can get this done. Absolutely. Really, it's a, it's a great honor to, uh, uh, to be with you <laughs> as well as to, uh, to serve the community in this way. Very important work, very gratifying work. And uh, you're, you're right. Together, we will uh, eliminate hate in our society. Thank you. Scott Richman here on Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. Scott Richman, Regional Director, ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. I'm John Marino on The Beat in Westchester, produced by Shark Creative, made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built by White Plains Hospital and by Michael Labriola Landscape Design and Construction in our month. Catch all of our Westchester, Rockland, Putnam, Dutchess, Fairfield, and Orange County programming on our YouTube channel, Shark Creative YouTube.